was probably in Disneyland. At the, uh, hold on one second, bro. Uh, yeah, at the, uh, the Zartuce. Dude, that's funny what you said about the horse. Yeah, I'll tell you in a second. Am I allowed to have a dip in? Yeah, man, you're allowed to swear. You're allowed to do whatever you want. All right. I already talk funny as it is, man, with these big ass lips. So oh, dude. that dip it must be must be a young sound thing. All right, tell me about it. Hey, um, what what, what are you going to be starting it? Is that what we're going to oh. open into too? Is with the Anaheim or what do you want to? Yeah, we're already starting, man. Let's talk about that because um, oh, let let me see the. <clears throat> are you hearing the? Is it coming in clear? Yeah. All right, cool. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah, man. Um, but real quick, we'll tap into when, you know, growing up, too, though. Uh, we'll start off with that. But, yeah, well, it's funny. I was just talking with my dad. You remember my pops, man. He he loved you, and uh, he loves your parents, too. It was uh, – he always got ran over by that horse. That was Jorge Arce's uh, horse. Yeah, man. Yep. And yeah, uh, he, he, your dad was a great – your dad's a great dude, man. He was uh, part of my formative formidable years when we were kids. Yeah. Dude, there's a speed Good old time. Are you hearing this feedback? Hey, let me take my case off. My case messes up my phone. All right. Let me see if it, if it sounds a little better without the case. Is that a little better or no? No, you're right. There's no, yeah, that. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, but, um. So that horse, so that horse thing, right? <laughs> We're in, we're in yeah. the crowd, and the whole crowd was chanting uh, Mexico. And right behind us was that Luis Castillo guy. Yeah. And, and when you knocked when you knocked Zertuche out in the eighth round cold, we started chanting <laughs> Ohio. Because four of my buddies had flown from Youngstown to see that fight to stay with me. Mm -hmm. and, Zer and one of Castillo's guys throws a punch <laughs> at one of my buddies. <laughs> And it start. They started brawling in the stand right there. Youngstown. Dude, uh, that Youngstown's been in plenty of fights. Uh, uh, plenty of fist fights at those fights. Um, yeah, my dad almost got bit by the horse. Uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then Castillo. I'll tell you a funny story about that. So after the fight, in, a, in the hotel lobby, we're all chilling, and I, I'm sitting with uh, Jose Luis Castillo. He buys like. Five bottles of champagne. We're all sipping on champagne. He's talking to me, and I'm talking to him. And he don't speak English, <laughs> but we're carrying on a conversation for like an hour, dude. <laughs> oh man, that was that, that Anaheim. That was funny. That was probably one of the the cooler fights. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the Mexican fans came up afterwards, and they had uh, Mexican flags up by my hotel room, wanting the autograph and everything. It was crazy. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you too about because I was looking at your stats. You fought in Vegas for your tenth pro fight. It was in Mandalay. You fought. You fought a Mario Lopez in your tenth pro fight. Yeah, well, I fought. I see. So you know better than I do. I have to go back to box track. I fought in Vegas a lot early on in my career um, on the undercards of like De La Hoya. I was on the undercard of De La Hoya Vargas. Um, yeah, there was a handful of times. A lot of yeah, at the Mandalay Bay. Um, New Orleans, I fought. Yeah. What was it always? I remember the media. You know, as you as you won the, your your belt, everybody would always write about how how composed you are. You know, like the lights were never too big for you know for you to fight under. Talk about that. What do you think? What do you think kind of conditioned you to be that calm and that that patient when all the lights were on? <laughs> the dude had two hands. And I was going into a fight. Um, you know, my whole thing was winning, you know, going in. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be that, that person that hard had to say, like, oh, the lights, did, you know, I didn't realize it or notice it. I did. And that was the difference between early on in the career and later on when you get to that big stage. Um, but once that bell rang, I knew w what I had to do. And I didn't let anything catch up to me. I didn't let the, the fans. You know, it, it, we were talking about that a little bit on my podcast. You use the fans when you need them. And I think a lot of fighters do that and some don't. And unfortunately, I think the ones that don't end up getting hurt by that. But, um, 
mainly it was showtime. Like I, I stuck to my game plan. I, I had to. I had a guy in front of me wanting to knock me out as much as I want to knock him out. And that, that big stage, I liked it. I liked it after the fight. I liked it before the fight. But if I didn't perform and do what I was supposed to do in there, that shit would have been gone. You know what I mean? That 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 wouldn't have been there no more. That big stage, because you know, in boxing or as in any sport, man, that you got a, sh a short window, a small window of opportunity, and that shit's gone quick too. So, yeah. What was that like when? Uh, what's that like when you're eye to eye? And you're, you know, let's talk about Taylor. When you make eye contact with him, and you know that he gave you everything he had, and you were still there. Did you know that in the second round? No, I'll tell you what, uh, that's a good question. Actually, in the third round was when I knew I had that fight won. You know, and you because I kind of had to put myself in his situation, in his perspective. He just threw all them punches. He had me out on my feet. He had me um, falling all over the place in the ring. And he just wasted a lot of energy. And then usually after somebody puts an ass whooping on somebody like that, when they come out the next round, you're hoping to, to take them out again. As where I came out in that third round like an animal, I threw 98 punches in, in round number three. I had him against the ropes, and, and I think right there, I didn't see so much because of how I was hitting him, but I could just see in his expression and in his body expression that I just took everything out of him. Like, he was so close, and then he was, he was a little bit tired, and then I come back. Not only was he getting a little bit tired, but I come back and throw 98 punches after that. I took a lot out of him. I think from at that point, I knew I had that fight won. Yeah, Kel, what were you doing for your conditioning, man? Should do a lot of it. Youngstown, you know, a lot of the work that that we do in Youngstown. Uh, I was with Ironman Warehouse with Dunner. Um, I was training there, doing the uh, functional strength training, which consists of a lot of cardio. I was training like six, seven hours a day. I would either run the YSU Stadium, the high side, all of it, and uh, or I'd be doing three miles through Mill Creek Park. I did um, the boxing gym, obviously, three hours a day there. I had strength training with Rock at Rockies where we did like, like 600 to 500 to 600 reps of body part. Um, at the YMCA at nighttime, swimming and, and doing things like that. Jesus. So it was it was hard where we didn't overtrain. You know, you had to, that was another thing I, I think that we did a great job on. We always knew how to break it, when to cut it back, and and how long to go. So, were you powerlifting then? No, not at all. Okay. Not, powerlifting, lifting you can you can lift when you uh when you box, mm -hmm. but uh, powerlifting and boxing don't go. They, Those they are two no no. Yeah. No. So, do you remember? So we were twelve, man, nineteen ninety four, and I, I brought up the Canfield Fair in the introduction, and. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was, I was telling a story. Do you remember Ben McGowan? Who did he play with? He played for Ohio Carpet with me. He was a young buck. He was young. Yeah, yeah so familiar though. Ben and I were walking around the Campbell Fair, and we see you by the boxing game, and grown men, you're challenging them who can hit the bag heavier. And do you remember <laughs> this at all? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Because it was the only time I did. It was the only year I did it at the Capitol Fair. I'll tell you something funny about that. But, yeah, who's uh, dude, I, I did that, and then the next day my hand was swallowed up, too, because I hit it like 500 times. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I had to ice it. Yeah. Man. How did, yeah, how did the, um, because <laughs> the narrative when we were kids was all about your brother, your older brother, especially boxing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I tell all my friends about you, I'm, you know, playing baseball and catching. And you mentally, though, as the younger one, your psychology with that pressure, your dad was, was an athlete, you, you know, your brother. When did you know that you could be a, a professional boxer? When did you know you could be a champ? How old were you? I was right around the 15, 16. See, like, the baseball... You know, you bring up my brother, and that's, that's a good point. My brother Michael was like, and I, and I was comparing that the other day with somebody where I was talking he was a to. Stud. Yeah, and, and, and he had, I mean, in, in his speed, like Michael was faster than me. Michael would be able to jump higher than me. You know what I mean? And, and he was shorter. Michael was able to dunk his sophomore year at 5'10. Um, and I'm not just saying that, like people ask. 
I go, listen, I was like, I was a world champion athlete. But my brother Michael, man, he he was an athlete, like athlete, athlete. But I go back and I think about it. You know, I got play, I played baseball. But a lot of times I got done with baseball. A lot of kids went home and you know, like practice more or threw the ball around, and I would go straight to the boxing gym. You know what you I mean? Do like that when we were twelve. Yeah, yeah. I would come down. I I was boxing. I twelve. I started at eleven, in ninety three, and um, I would come down to a lot of times to practice with Rick, with Ron and Ellie, and I'd be bringing my boxing clothes or my spikes and everything. And I would just put my spikes on and, but I was able to get by with off a of natural athletic. I think my brother Michael was better, but I seem like when I play like even Pee Wee football, I think my instincts was what I had over him though. Like he was fast, but I would be able to get to a play just by reading it. You know what I mean? A football or like baseball as catcher, you know, it wasn't the prettiest, but I would do whatever it took to, to keep the ball in front of me. You know what I mean? Um, and especially catching you who threw. And I still tell stories about that when we were playing, you know, like the home run derbies. I mean, we I would hit like six home runs in the batting practice, and you'd hit like nine. And then, but the regular season, you had like 13 home runs. I had two. You know yeah, what I mean? And it was, time, uh, you were catching. Oh, it was, just, nah, it was just a difference between, you know, game time and, and uh, I hit. I, I got base hits, so that's all that mattered. But it, it was, uh, you know, that, that's where it came from with, like, the sports, like in football. I played linebacker, quarterback. And, yeah, there, yeah there, and there would be a kid down on the other team. He was faster than me, and they had me at corner. But I, my instincts, like, I read the play quicker, and I got to that spot where I was supposed to be. So that, that you know, for the speed. And I wasn't slow by no means. We all know that. Um, you know what I mean? But I wasn't some of them other guys. And, uh, yeah, but the sports, and then, it kept going and going, and, and boxing was going good. I was doing the boxing, but it was kind of like in between football, in between TV football, and in between the baseball. I played. I ended up going to Babe Ruth. I played Babe Ruth baseball, and again, it was more of the same. Actually, I didn't have much time at all to practice in Babe Ruth because that's when I was getting to the age 13, 14, and 15, and boxing was getting big. And uh, But I was doing okay in some of those fights. Mm. And then it got to a point where I really got serious in boxing, and I was 16, and I think it was 17, and I was winning. And actually, I'll talk to be brutally honest with you. When I was 16, I knew because I was sparring pros. I'm not going to throw no names out there, but uh-huh. I was sparring. I was sparring professional guys who were good and, and, and prospects and up and coming. And I was in there, and they they were in their early to mid 20s, and I was I was laying it on them. I'm talking yeah. about like uh, laying it on him. It wasn't even a uh, competition. And then I, I was up here, I was sort of going, dude, like I just went in there against this guy who was a pro, you was know. It your and, power, and... Kelly? Was, was it your power? Or... No, at that was age, the power came. Or... The power came overnight. The power, I don't know where it came from. I don't know if that came with maturity and leverage on the punch because you know, as far as like baseball and, and anything else, any sport, the old saying, like if if you ain't got if if you didn't have it in the cradle, you're probably not going to ever have it. You know, so like if you're a home run hitter, you can work on it, and you may do some strength training to pick up to hit two or three more home runs a year, but usually home run hitters are born with that. They're born with that natural swing, the torque, and the same in boxing. You know, you can lift all the weights you want. You're not, If you're not a knockout puncher, you're not really going to become one. As where when I was young, <laughs> I'd be in her boxing people. Then when I hit, like, 16 – I started knocking people, stopping people with the amateurs. And um, along with the boxing, too, though, my boxing was phenomenal. And uh, I say right around like 16 years old, I knew I was done because I actually I stopped baseball. And then I ended up going to play a little B uh, instead of class B because I was still a little too young. And I played that off and on. What you know, and I didn't even really. Uh, the Bandits. Okay. Yeah, with my car, and yeah, yeah and and Kello. um, Kello. yeah, and Ryan Caesar and, and guys yeah, like those, that. Those um, kids were studs, man. Yeah, and Ryan was the other catcher. I split time with him, and and kind of then like after that, you know, I, I was just it was that thing where I got to put the time in the boxing because I'm yeah. I'm advancing to regional tournaments and I'm fighting guys who I had 28 amateur fights. These guys got 120 amateur fights. And I'm giving, I'm giving them a go. You know what I mean? And then 98. So yeah, 16, 16 years old. 
I went in and I won two national titles that year. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I was done with, with all the other sports and it was just boxing. And just in that little short period of time from 16, cause I signed the contract actually at, at 17 years old and, um, Top right? pro. Yeah. And I, I signed that contract, I believe in early April, right around my birthday. So I may have just turned 18 my senior year. And then I have my pro debut June, which was a month after I graduated. And, uh, but I do like right around that stage, right at the end, like, okay, I love, I love baseball. I love all the other things, but you know, this is going to be my sport. This is what is, is my, yeah, that's my calling. So yeah, the guys, I, the guys in your era, I mean, one of my favorite fighters, all my favorite fighters, I always tell people this. I stopped watching the UFC during your career because yeah. I, I was a big MMA fan. And then I watched you, um, become pro and I, I only watch your fights and then around you though you had like Paul Williams you know who got into that, that you know he was a great he was a good fighter yeah, Taylor yeah you had uh, Edson Miranda um, Sergio all these guys coming up you really didn't have any easy fights before that Taylor fight no no you know and a lot of them and a lot of them was even the, the, the worst part about it is a lot of those were dangerous fights like for instance the Zartucci <laughs> Yeah, dude. Nobody wanted to fight Zartucci. I mean, he was seventeen and three, I think, or, or no, seventeen and one at he the time, was or something like that. Yeah, he was a Mex- he he Mexican. Mexican. Though I remember, what, like, I was like in the fourth row. And, yeah, and, and he was. Tr- he was, the eighth round knockout. I still, I show my friends that he was out cold on his feet. It's one of the greatest yeah. knockouts, in my opinion, ever. Because um, he was. It was almost like the Mortal Kombat. He was talking. Yeah, it was shit. like that. He was, and you know, he was cool after, which sometimes that happens in boxing. Yeah, we always call that knockout like the the Mortal Kombat, like finish him the way he went out. But um, the Zartu, yeah, but that you know, he was a dangerous fighter, and a lot of guys didn't fight him, and that was kind of like my opening. I finally got to uh, break with HBO and was able to fight on that that network, and um, we went in there, and, and what a heck of a knockout it was for that, a brutal one. But Zartucci was a dangerous, so I was fighting guys like that. Or, like, when I won the NABF, I fought a dude, uh, Florencio Zuniga. His only loss was to Zartucci. He was 17-1 and one with 16 knockouts. He was signed by top rank. So I, I go to show you this guy. And I fought him for the NABF title. I mean, I had to take fights that other guys wouldn't to take. So even though they weren't big names, but people that are in the inside the boxing world, like, other matchmakers and promoters, they knew. You know, like when I when I knock when I stop a uh, Fernando Zuniga or when I knock out even Brock McCart, was he past his prime? Yeah, but he'd never been stopped before. He'd never been beat up like that. Um, and then you go up, and then yeah, you start getting into the Zartucci, and then of course mm-hmm. Edison Miranda. Yeah. You know, Imagine. people now because he lost a handful of fights after. But when I fought Edison Miranda. He was the most feared boxer, and he was more feared in 2007 than Arthur Aver or than uh, Triple G is now in the middleweight division. Yeah, but people forget media, that. And they and you were the underdog. The media thought uh, Miranda was going to win that fight. Yeah. And you starched him. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, and, and I don't care. You know, it's just funny how how sh- short term memory people have. Like they they live in that moment. Like time, the ten years gone past since that fight, and everybody just remembers his final record. But nobody remembers when when Edison Miranda was fighting. I remember how many people came up to me, my own friends, like, "Dude, I feel bad for you, man. Like, I know you're undefeated and you got a lot of knockouts, but this dude's a fucking monster." You know, and I, did I even start second guessing? Like, holy shit, yeah, man, what am I doing? But um, you know, I went in there and 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 beat the hell out of him. You know? Who's the guy? Who's the guy that you didn't get to fight that you wanted to? You know, the Paul Williams was one. Yep. Um, and then we tried making that fight. I'll never forget that. A lot of people said I ended up saying I was ducking Paul Williams. Listen, I feel horrible about you know the tragedy of Paul Williams because it's, it's such a great athlete and a guy who really took care of his body and trained as hard as he did and and, and the conditioning he was in. It's just a horrible thing, you know. Somebody like that, that does, they don't deserve that, you know. Especially as much as he uh, took care of himself, but I wanted that fight, you know what I mean? And and he was a welterweight coming up to middleweight. He wasn't really a big power puncher, 
people say that he had he had good power at welterweight. Um, so that was a fight that I wanted. Unfortunately, one fell through between the promotional guys, you know, my, my higher ups, and then the other one was when I had the staff infection and um, mm-hmm. or was started started having signs of that, and we had to pull out of that fight. So that was the whole issue. I wanted to fight Paul Williams. And, you know, to this day, we always say, like, I jumped up two weight classes to fight a all-time great legend, you know, when I jumped, when I jumped to 173, which B-hop. was light heavyweight, to fight B-Hop. But, yet you know, I was I, I was so afraid that I didn't fight a welterweight coming up. You know what yeah. I mean? So, uh, you know, it was funny, but Paul Williams was one of them because he, he, he was a tall guy, and he had that name, and he was just starting to campaign around the 154 in middleweight division. And uh, that that's the fight that I won, you know? Yeah. As, as Arthur you, as Abraham you, was another one. Who? who? Arthur Abraham was another uh, one that I would like to add. Yeah. How about one of the kids from um, Europe? Uh, I think Term? he retired undefeated. I thought you guys would end up fighting, but you never fought. He never came, he never came to America. Oh, Calzaghi. 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 I would love yeah. to fight him. Yeah. That yeah. would have been a good way. I tell you what, to this day, I still say... He was one of the most underrated fight, uh, champs that fought. I mean, people don't give him the credit, and it's usually certain people, a lot of people from the states. Um, but Calzaghi could fight. I mean, he did everything he was asked to do when he fought. Yeah, that's right, man. That was a good um, one. Now, like the modern state of boxing with these guys, are you, is there is there a couple guys you cheer for? Do you still watch the sport? Oh yeah, you know I'm a Lomachenko fan. I'm a Mikey Garcia. I'm I'm close to Mikey Garcia from when I. Oh, I like Errol Spence. I think he's a great fighter. I think Crawford, Terrence Crawford, is a great fighter. And by God, you got both of them in the same weight class. But is now you got Mikey. Fighting, yeah, that, my buddy's fighting Errol. So, of course, I got to go with Mikey because you know he's my a good friend of mine, and I, I trained with his brother, and I was part of the Garcia camp. Oh um, shit! And, I forgot about that. Yeah, and, yeah. And Mikey's just a cool dude, like one of the most down to earth, nicest people you ever meet. Um, you know, but that's going to be an interesting fight. Uh, I'm not picking on that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, 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 I'm going to be. I'm going to watch that fight more as a fan instead of you know having to pick who's going to win. Um, who else is out there? Yeah, Lashawn Porter from from Youngstown or from Akron, Cleveland area. Um, he's at the 147, the same weight class as Earl Spence and and Terrence Crawford. He's a great fighter. I follow him. So it's just loaded right now with a lot of good fighters. But I think yeah. boxing in 2018, is like 2017 and 2018 has been some great years with, with boxing. Yeah, for sure. Let's see if it's frozen. Boxing. Yeah, the one thing, that I'm, I'm glad we finally got to but, do this, man, because to, to show people maybe down here and who listen to my show – how smart and visceral you are, man. You've always been that way. Um, you know, very calculated in your approach on the baseball field and in the ring. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. No, man, in, in, in the Hopkins fight, because you hear, like, like I've heard Rogan on record say that, you know, a lot of people say that was a dumb decision to go fight him at 170. But you deciding to do that, was that because you knew that you could share space with a legend, win, lose, or draw? No, that was because, um, first of all, we had the, the couple of cancellations of the Paul Williams and other fights. And then even though I fought Edison Miranda, or just say Zartucci, Edison Miranda, then I fought Taylor, and then I gave Taylor what he wanted, which a lot of fighters don't do, an immediate rematch. Different weight, right? Then I fought... Yeah, then I fought Gary Lockett. So then, like, and there was already a little bit of rumblings of like, oh, why is he fighting Gary Lockett? You know, like, I was, I was, I didn't deserve an easy fight. Um, so we took the fight with Hopkins because there was nobody else out there, and it would have been bad. The backlash on fighting another Gary Lockett type opponent or somebody not worthy to to the boxing fans, it would have been probably ugly. Um, but that Hopkins fight, you know, I never really said much on it, and I still don't use it to an excuse. I just say how it is. Um, Thomas Hauser, who's a big writer, um, he wrote stories on Muhammad Ali. He used to work for New York Times. Thomas Hauser is a big writer, and he's he's not biased towards anybody. He just what he sees is what he writes down. 
he was in the locker room before the Hopkins fight, and it's actually in one of the books. Sometime I'll have to send it to you or show you it. Um, he was there, and he knows what went on with that fight. You know, I sparred maybe three times the entire camp for that fight. And then, of course, being sick, and it's in the book, you know, he, like I said, he's seen what happened when the commission came in, mm-hmm. and I had to give him the, the prescription medication that I was on. You know, I had, a, they took my temperature, it was 101.3, um, and, and I went into that fight, and how I felt and what I was going through is what showed up in that ring. I mean, uh, Hopkins is a smart fighter. I'm not taking anything away from that. My God, he, his record and who he fought shows, but... I was not Kelly Pavlik that night. You know what I mean? Like, I knew some of the things I wanted to do and how I wanted to counter, but from my head to my hand, I couldn't pull the trigger. You know what I mean? Um, It was just one of those type fights where there was nothing you could do. I kept saying, you know what, after the third round, going maybe going into the fourth, I'll warm up. But um, I never did. You know, I never got to that that situation where I was able to, so it just sucked. Yeah, do you still hit the heavy bag? I do. I started doing it because I have to try to loosen up. You know, I always said I don't want to be one of them big guys that walk around and can't scratch my ass. So, yeah, I still I still work on it. I hit the bag a little bit. Yeah, me being, uh, uh, me, me being a, a, a peer for the sport and kind of like believing in magic a bit, I always think that you're going to come back as a heavyweight and become the champ again. Hey, there's possibilities of that. There really is. Um you know, like people keep saying it, and uh, right now it's not going to happen. Beat, dude, you beat Fury, man. Yeah, they, but it's but it's not. It's never out of the question. It's just the fact, like right now, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Um, and I, and I, realistically, I don't think it's ever going to happen again. Um, yeah. You know, I'm 36, and even by the time that I say, you know what, I am going to make a comeback, I'll be. Damn near 37 and a half, you know, so, yeah. but you never yeah. know. Like, what I mean by that, they would have to come with it. to be something ridiculous that I don't see anybody throwing me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to come back and fight for a half a mil. I'm not going to come back and fight for two mil. Like, it's going to have to be something that's like, hey, Kel, we're going to give you $10 million to fight Anthony Joshua. Then you'll see me in there. Yeah. <laughs> no tune-up. Yeah, no, Kel- no tune-up. Yeah, <laughs> no tune up, just one off. Yeah, mm-hmm. talk, talk about uh, the punchline and, and also your gym. Oh, cool, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, I got the uh, podcast, The Punchline. Um, mm-hmm. well, you put in The Punchline with Kelly Pavlik and James Dominguez, or you can go right to our site, our homepage, and that's just thepunchline.live. And, um, you know, we have a lot of great guests on there. It's, it's unfiltered, it's unscripted. You know, and we open up, we do uh, where the fans can ask questions on YouTube right there, and we answer them. That's what, that's what our show is kind of like formatted around. Um, I know it's unscripted, but so it's not re- – so we go into it just kind of like tossing it around and shooting the shit, but we also answer questions. So we do Facebook Live, and then we also do – that's why when you watch it, you see us staring at our phone all the time because we kind of built it around the fans and the listeners, you know, so we try to answer every question. Um, I get the YouTube questions and I fire those back because a lot of people watch podcasts and things like that. And a lot of people would like to have their own opinion and, and like be able to, um, talk and, and, uh, you know, interact with the, the people and they can't, they just got to sit there for an hour and listen. Um, and sometimes they have call-ins, which that ain't fun. You know, if you're, you might not be lucky enough to get through. So that's why we try to interact with the listeners and we answer all the questions. Um, we have great guests on, but I think the part that kind of like bites us in the ass a little bit, we can pull up Joe Lewis from the, from the six feet under and put him in a chair and have his, have his ghost talking. And a lot of people don't care. They, they just keep firing questions like, well, what yeah. do you think the, 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 the Lenar is Lomachenko fight? They don't care that you got Joe Lewis there. <laughs> Yeah. answering questions um, <laughs> or on the phone, but we get great guests and, you know, some of the listeners will, will listen to um, the, the call-ins and the guests that we have on, but it, it's fun, man. We threw it around and, and it's getting bigger. You know, I'm at a lot of these fights and, and it's, it's cool. And then as far as the gym, I got the uh, fitness gym where I'm actually at now. And uh, 
that's coming along. It's, it's, uh, you know, we got cardio, we do anything from, uh, spinning, yoga, boxer fit classes, um, all kinds of things to power lifting and, uh, regular, uh, what, you know, strength training. And then I have, uh, unbreakables with Lonnie, probably the ones where you see me lifting. So I've got kind of like a part. Yeah. That's kind of like a partnership that me and him got. Um, I'm part of his gym. But I'm, me and him are more of a team as far as with the Unbreakables on a promotional standpoint. Um, and I do that with him, but I do my, my benching and everything out of there. So. All right, man. What's the, um, what's the name of your gym in Columbiana? My gym. Oh, that's what it's called? Okay, with, yeah, yeah, with an eye. We did that, too. You know, um, I do. I, I, I could get shit for that one because it sounds like a little egotistical. But, that, <laughs> but we actually, it was actually called that to make the other members feel comfortable like because everybody you know people get nervous going to a gym when they first like go in and everything else so like when somebody asks them like hey where do you work out at they're like oh my gym you know at my gym so it's just kind of to make the, the members feel uh feel a little comfortable that's awesome man so one of the things i also do kelly is i'm a strength coach and i coach the squat the deadlift the press share with me some of your numbers Right now, man, I've just been doing this a little less than two years. And about exactly two years ago, I was farting and sneezing to get 225 up one time. You know what I mean? Okay. And uh, I don't even think – actually, I don't even think I was able to get to on a bench 225. Uh, now I'm up to 360, my PR, and I do a lot of power meet, uh, powerlifting meets. At the meet – well, at the gym, I got 350 paws, but at the meets, I'm right now 340. Um we're working on it though. Uh, deadlift, I'm up. I just really started doing that the last eight months. I'm up to like four, four twenty-five, which ain't a lot. Nothing to brag about. And um, you know, and then the the squat, I haven't even tried that, dude. I'm just getting into that. I don't think I'm ever going to compete because my leg, my knees are already bad as it is from all the running. So like, I do a little bodybuilding type squats. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't go all the way down into the pocket. You won't see me uh, get down that low. And I don't go too heavy, so. Yeah, you should uh, you, you, just so you don't avoid that movement, you should do squats from the seated position. So start from the oh, seated. Oh, squats, I do. And then trigger the glutes. It'll, it'll save your knees. Yeah, definitely. I do a lot of those, and I I stay light too because I'm more yeah. so concerned about getting my my quads big too. And you get your quads big by lightweight and you know a lot of reps. When you want to start working your ass or getting strong on the squats, you'll start seeing your ass and your and your hamstrings getting big. You know what I mean? Because it targets when you go heavier on squats, it targets different areas of the of the lower body. So. Yeah. All right. I gotta hear it out of your mouth because you know we're from Youngstown. You could ask a hundred different people the the question; they'll give you a hundred different stories. Tell the people how you got your nickname. That goes from my brother Michael. And that also goes from Cleveland. Um, it's a mixture of both. It was a coincidence, kind of, and, and a weird one. I was fighting in Cleveland in a tournament, and I was, like, the only color kid there. I was, <laughs> I was white. I was the only white kid. And um, they all started calling me Ghost. And then I came home, and my brother Michael was watching the tape. And before he even, because he couldn't hear or understand anybody, that was, like, DHS days. And um, he couldn't understand what anybody was saying. And he, he was watching me fight, and he goes, man, he's like, you move. And they're like, you're like a ghost. You know, like you're slick. So he was saying it from a different standpoint. They were calling it, calling me ghost from a different, uh, for a different reason. And it just was kind of a coincidence that that nickname, Ghost, I just started getting called Ghost. My brother Michael wasn't at the fights. You know what I mean? So he didn't get to hear it. He just seen on, on the video so it was kind of like, holy shit, man! That, that's actually a cool nickname. I think we're gonna, what is it called? Me, call me the ghost. Kelly and then ever since then, man. yeah, there was nobody, nobody had it besides uh, Robert the Ghost Guerrero, who you know that's the only other person I know of. Yeah. Hey, man, I really, I really appreciate you know us being able to finally do this, man. I want to say thank you and thanks for sharing space with me, Kelly. Oh, uh, dude, no yeah. problem. I'm sorry, I would have got to it earlier, man. It's good to hear from you, dude. It truly yeah. is. Uh, you always be my homie, and when you get back into town again, maybe this time we can uh, catch up. So one hundred percent, man. Yo, Kelly, off the record, uh, 
uh, off the record, what I'm going to do is I'll get this edited and marketed up um, on your Sunday night, my Monday. Okay. Do you want me to just pull a photo from the internet? Do you have a photo you want me to use for marketing? Uh, I could probably send you one yeah. through your Facebook. Yeah, I mean, if you pull one up, you got to pull, pull a good one, though. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Pull, hey, none of the mug shots. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How crazy. Dude, what a small world we live in. Like, you, you know, I grew up with Tony Hitchcliffe, too. I, you know what? He told me when we were in Columbus when I went down because we went to this restaurant after, and I sat right across, and we just bullshitted, like, not yeah. about boxing, not about comedy. We were just talking about, like, Gerard. And and I still, he never told me, like, his parents owned a restaurant. I understand, you know what I mean? But he told me they owned a restaurant, but yeah. I never. Um, On Belmont, uh, Joey's. Yeah. Yeah, I figured it was in, in, on Belmont somewhere. But, yeah, we just bullshit. We shot, you know, talked all night long. And uh, Rogan was a couple of chairs down, but he was cool as fuck. I don't even know. I got lucky. I mean, we went there. We had backstage to go back after, you know, passes. So I went in there, and I was—I know how that shit goes. So I didn't want to bother them. I didn't want to talk too long. I just wanted to go back, and mainly with Joe Rogan to eventually get on his show. And he told me in November that I, that he would have me on, but I never bothered him after that. You know, I'm not—I'm not like that. I'm not going to keep texting them or. So I haven't heard from him, but Tony also told me. He has a podcast on Mondays. He does, and he said, "But I'm not, if I'm ever out there, which I got to go out there anyways to cover Mikey Garcia's camp, you know, for the show. So I am going to hit Tony up and get and see if I can get on his show. And then, um, but yeah, we just kind of bullshit. We were standing back there, and that's what Rogan was telling me. You know, he's getting me on. And then the next thing you know, I was getting ready. I was trying to get my co-host uh, James out there because he was starstruck." I was like, all right, let these guys fucking have fun, man. They want to smoke weed, drink, eat, fuck, whatever they want to do. Let's go. And uh, we're leaving, and Joe Rogan goes, hey, what do you guys got going on? And I was like, look. He's like, you want to go grab something to eat with us? So then that's how we ended up going to that restaurant and, and uh, eating. Plus, I'm, I'm close with Matt Brown, too. I just had him so, on the show. Yeah, oh, well, yeah? yeah? He's a good dude. Well, he's actually really close with my co-host, James Dominguez. All right. So... Yeah. yeah he, another Ohio boy. You know, Kel, yep. man, you take care, and I'll be in touch, brother. And I'm definitely going to link up when I come back to Youngstown. Sounds good, Joe. I appreciate it, man. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon, all right? See you later, bro. All right. I'll talk to you. All right, kid.